So hello, everybody. I am Michael Acton-Smith, and I run a game studio in London called Mind Candy. And our big hit, our, our monster game, is something called Moshi Monsters, which I'll be talking about today. Moshi is a sort of cross between Tamagotchi and Facebook for kids. It's a browser-based online flash game. And I'm uh, just curious, how many of you guys have, have heard about Moshi? Oh, fair few. Excellent. How many have played it? Still a fair few. Fantastic. It's aimed at a slightly younger audience, sort of 7 to 11. But uh, <laughs> if you're young at heart, you're very welcome to play as well. We've got a lot of mums and grandmothers and, and dads playing Moshi, which is fantastic. So I'm going to start with a, a graph um, just to show you where we've come from. So we built the game, the basic version of the game, in 2007. We put it live in early 2008. Uh, we hit our tipping point in 2009, and then we've been holding on for dear life ever since. And we're now at 22 million registered users. Uh, we're adding a new user every single second. Uh, over 2 million new players are signing up every month. So it's uh, definitely heading in the right direction. Um, it's a freemium model, so we are, the game is free. Most of our 20 million are playing for free. I wish they were all paying. Uh, sadly not. But a, a very sizable proportion are. And uh, we launched subscription in January 2009. And in May, just a few months later, uh, we were cash flow positive. So you can see how unprofitable these games can be when you get the kind of uh, foundations right. Um, in terms of demographics, it's about 65% uh, female. Uh, the core audience is 7 to 11. And our three biggest markets are the UK, the US, and Australia. Um, and uh, as I say, it's been a, a good start. And we've learned an awful lot building this game. I don't want to stand here and just tell you how wonderful we are. Because um, although we put a few good products out and made some great features, we've made a lot of mistakes along the way as well. And I'm sure there are a lot of people in this audience very interested in the online gaming space and social gaming. And what I hope to do is, is talk about some of the lessons we've learned that will be valuable for you guys as, as you develop games in this very new and exciting industry. So there's about 10 lessons that I'm going to touch upon. But first, before we dive into all the juicy stuff, just a step backwards. I set up Mind Candy in 2004 and uh, raised about $10 million in venture finance from two of the biggest VCs in the world for a game called Perplex City. I uh, don't know if anyone remembers this one. Not so many. <laughs> yes. One or two. All right. <laughs> Excellent. A few fans out there. So this was an alternate reality game, which was um, a big, supposedly going to be a huge uh, kind of area of the, the games industry. And it was very exciting and a lot of uh, attention, a lot of venture capital flowed into it. And uh, what we did was we created a, um, a world, Perplex City, and uh, we buried a treasure somewhere in the world. And we released clues across different media, so text message, um, websites, we created a fake magazine and a CD. We had actors at live events and helicopters. And we burnt our way through the venture capital pretty damn quickly. Um, and uh, the investors weren't too impressed. Um, we amassed about 50,000 users in total. Very passionate, wonderful users. But it definitely wasn't enough to support uh, the massive ambitions that we had. And I took the very painful decision to put Perplex City on hold. And uh, this was the, the first lesson that we, we learned. Basically, in this new industry of, of social online gaming, we're going to make a lot of screw-ups. We're going like, to make a lot of mistakes. No one has all the answers. And I think we need to embrace failure, as Ian said, said at the start. So don't be afraid to fail. Just make sure you fail fast. Don't do what we did and spend three years of your life banging away on one product um, and $9 million of venture capital, because um, I can assure you VCs are not very happy about that. We had some pretty stressful board meetings. Um, so yeah, it was, uh, it was a fascinating learning experience. And uh, I mentioned that we raised $10 million in venture capital. We spent about $9 million. We still had a little bit left. And we had enough for just one more roll of the dice. And I previously had founded a company called Firebox. And uh, I used to travel the world going to toy shows. And I uh, was fascinated by the virtual pet space, which um, a lot of people assume is quite niche. And, uh, but it's actually a multi-billion dollar industry. And uh, kids love um, the whole nurturing play. The nurturing is a very important play pattern for, for children. And I was sitting in a coffee shop a few years ago sketching out new ideas. And this was the first ever Moshi Monster I drew, or Puzzle Monster, as I originally called it. Um, parents and teachers loved the name Puzzle Monsters. Kids absolutely hated it. Uh, so we changed it to, to Moshi. And uh, I'd been thinking about this space, as I mentioned. And as technology has advanced, we've seen more sophisticated virtual pets. All the way back in the 70s, the pet rock 
which is a very low-tech uh, virtual pet. Uh, as crazy as this sounds, they, they sold millions of these pet rocks. Um, they came in a little carry case with a bit of straw and a manual about how to look after your rock, and people loved them as quirky gifts. Then we had Beanie Babies and Tamagotchi, uh, Furby, a little more sophisticated, then Neopets. Um, Nintendogs, I think, has sold about 18 million units on the DS, one of the best-selling DS games of all time. Webkins a few years ago. But we wanted to do something a little different, to create a very uh, emotionally resonant, beautifully animated virtual pet that kids could, could look after. And the key twist was that we were going to create a social layer on top. So children would not just look after their pet in a one-to-one -one relationship like a Tamagotchi, but they could share their pet with their friends and show how they were doing and discuss their strategies and, and their tips. And uh, that was the, the starting point to Moshi. So I'm just going to give a quick whiz through, for a um, quick walkthrough for anyone that, that hasn't seen it. You adopt a pet. Monster, you choose one of six types, you fill in the adoption papers, and then your little monster lives in its room, that, uh, and kids can uh, tickle the monster and tell it to walk around. And uh, the key engagement loop that keeps children coming back, something that we're very um, proud of, is the puzzle palace. So I mentioned in the early days we wanted to call it puzzle monsters, and I believe very strongly in uh, combining games and education. I think there's huge, huge opportunities in that space, and we're still scratching the surface. We didn't want to go down the educational game route because kids turn their nose up at, at it. They have enough learning at school. We wanted to weave the educational elements in <coughs> under the radar. We call it stealth education. So there are 35 different puzzle games that kids can do. Uh, everything from uh, basic counting to logic, anagrams, general knowledge. The most popular, bizarrely, is a flag game. And um, one of my friends was in New York recently with her family, and a five-year-old was walking down the street, and uh, she was reciting the names of countries as she walked. Um, uh, Canada and uh, Australia and Peru, and uh, her mum turned to her and asked her what she was doing, and she realised she was pointing at the flags outside a hotel and naming flags that her parents didn't even know. And uh, they were pretty flabbergasted, and uh, they asked where she heard about this, and she said Moshi, so they went home and bought a membership. So that was great. Um, and there's, there's lots of um, kind of anecdotal evidence of that, of kids learning all sorts of wonderful things and not even realizing they're learning. And when they do their puzzles every day, they earn rocks. And uh, they love rocks because rocks is the in-game currency that they can then go and do one of their favorite activities, which is shopping. And there's a big world to explore. They can buy a lot of stuff for their room, so they can go to Yakia and buy their furniture. Uh, they can go to the grocery store and buy food for their monster. If they've got a lot of rocks, they can go to Horrid's and buy the, the rare items. There's an underground disco in the secret tunnels where they can play and dance with their monster. Um, and ultimately, what they want to do is customize their room and show off uh, what a great designer they are and uh, how well-dressed their monster is and how, what great uh, accessories it has. Uh, there's a ton of other stuff as well for kids to do. There's, um, we've even got our own version of Farmville, where kids can plant seeds in their garden. And if they get the right combination of seeds, they attract something called a little moshling. And uh, I know this sounds a bit bizarre, but um, kids love virtual pets, but they love virtual pets for their virtual pet even more. And uh, this has just been, this has blown us away how popular this is. It's almost like digital Pokemon. Um, Chop Chop the Cheeky Chimp is a very common moshling, all the way through to the rarest, Iggy, uh, at the bottom right. And uh, if kids attract rare moshlings, then they get more visitors to their room, and they uh, get more status. And um, this has been a, a very successful part of the game. So this was all, a lot of this stuff we've added later, but we put the, the basic version of Moshi out, a um, uh, very early version, in late 2007. And we were looking around the industry to figure out how on earth we were going to monetize this. And there was a successful product around that time called Webkins, which, and it's still ticking along OK, um, you buy a plush toy at retail, and it's got a unique code around its neck. And you type that unique code in online, and uh, your physical pet comes alive uh, in the virtual world. And they were selling um, in great numbers when we were uh, launching Moshi in 2007. And we thought, let's try and replicate that model. So we came up with the idea of creating what are called Mopods, which are little phone charms that spin when you get a, a, a phone call. And uh, in every single packet, we put a unique code that uh, kids could type in and, and unlock a pet online. And it was an absolute disaster. <laughs> um, I've still got tens of thousands sitting in a warehouse if anyone wants some. 
But um, you, the problem was no one knew about Moshi Monsters at, at this time. We were trying to charge for a, a product that no one had heard of. There was no um, element for virality. Most of our users didn't, e ha didn't even have mobile phones. Uh, retailers didn't even want to, didn't want to stock a product they'd never heard of. So in every element, we, we failed. It was a bit of a disaster. So this was our second important lesson. Don't blindly follow the market leader. And we've seen this happen a lot in the kids space. When Disney bought Club Penguin for hundreds of millions of dollars, tons of venture capital, tons of talent flowed into the kids space online. And most people tried to replicate what Club Penguin did. We've seen Club Penguin for all sorts of different creatures. And replicating that doesn't necessarily work. And it happens in a lot of industries as well. And what we believe is there are many different ways to create uh, popular online content for kids. If you look at the offline parallel, the toy industry is worth $20 billion a year. There are multiple different play patterns um, offline. We've only seen a few of those emerge online. I think there's massive opportunity. So we took a slightly different route um, and decided that copying Webkins was, was not the best way to go and copying Club, Club Penguin was not right either. <coughs> so we scrapped the idea of Mopods and we thought, let's make the game free. <coughs> and then we'll worry about figuring how we're going to monetize it later. And our investors reluctantly uh, <laughs> agreed. We didn't have too many other options. But amazingly, it worked. We went from about five signups a day to 5,000 signups a day um, when we put uh, the, the site out for free, which was obviously pretty exciting. And after years and years of kind of banging away at this product and thinking one day we're, we're going to build something that works, we finally got our kind of uh, glimmer that uh, maybe we're onto something special. Kids, even though it was free, uh, were willing to sign up. And then slowly throughout 2008, our signups grew month by month as word spread and um, the game started taking off which was obviously very, very exciting. Um, so the third lesson, of course, was free is wonderful. Um, anyone can create something free and get lots of users, but you've got to figure out, if you're building a freemium model, what the meme bit is. And we sat and we, uh, we thought and how we could slice the game so that uh, we wouldn't scare off our free users, um, but we could attract enough paying users to, to make the whole thing work. And we came up with the idea of a Moshi Monsters passport. So kids could get access to new parts of the world, new shops. Uh, they could buy new items uh, to show off their status if their parents were happy buying a five pounds a month or 30 pounds a year Moshi passport. And we learned a lot at this point. This is something a lot of people in freemium kind of struggle with. Where do you cut that line? And uh, the two lessons that we took from this um, are as follows. The first is try and make your, your premium elements sliceable. So what I mean by that is have part of it accessible to all users. So everyone can taste it and see what it's like and, and uh, get their head around it. And then they know what they're getting if they're going to uh, buy the premium element. The second, even more important, is make sure that the premium element is visible. There's no point having rare items or cool stuff in an online world if no one else can see it. Um, and you know, that's why freemium models work so incredibly well in social settings where you can show off your status and other people can see uh, what you get if you become uh, a paying subscriber. So that was all well and good. We were planning these features. We were starting to build them, but we hadn't put it live yet. And we encountered our next problem. Uh, so this is late 2008. Uh, our million dollars didn't last very long. Uh, and we hadn't any revenue coming in. And so we thought we needed to raise just a little bit more money to get us over the line to the point where we were going to be charging for Moshi. Unfortunately, if anyone remembers, late 2008 um, was probably the worst time ever to try and raise uh, any venture capital. It was um, in the middle of the, the global financial meltdown. So uh, don't raise VC money during a global financial meltdown. Um, it definitely is, is not an easy thing to do. Uh, we had two term sheets um, that were pulled right at the last minute. Uh, we couldn't even get our existing investors to put more cash in. And in November, we were running on vapors. In December, we couldn't meet payroll at the end of the month. And uh, we were getting close to, or very close, within a matter of days, having to shut Moshi down. Fortunately, we found uh, one angel investor that took pity on us and uh, gave us a tiny bit of cash. And our investors, existing investors, came in and put a tiny bit of extra money into the business as well that allowed us to limp into January 2009 where we could start uh, generating revenue. And uh, we crossed our fingers and closed our eyes. And amazingly, uh, it worked. We, uh, we brought in tens of thousands of pounds that first weekend, um, which uh, was um, yeah, huge cause for celebration. We were cartwheeling down the street. And that's an amazing moment. I know this seems incredibly obvious, but when you're building an online game or any online product, or any 
uh, product. Um, revenue solves so many problems, you suddenly realize that people out there are willing to pay for something you've spent ages crafting. And now the problem comes, how do you scale that? So that's a whole new set of challenges, but at least we've got over the first issue and we were underway.